actually the first launch was not a restaurant business. Uh, the first launch was a church. You know, I pastored for seven years. So I'm Jonathan Hambrick, and I am the owner of My Kitchen, which is a byproduct of Big John's. We are a barbecue restaurant that kind of turned into an incubator commissary uh, for the community. Awesome. What's a commissary kitchen? A commissary kitchen is a safe place for food service professionals to kind of launch and dream. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to not only um, launch their dream, but also save and cut costs. Uh, and that's important because as they're dealing with menu development, when they're dealing with uh, real estate, when they're dealing with a whole lot of different aspects that's grabbing at that money as soon as we make it at our front counter. Uh, they need an option on the back end that can help them manage it, and uh, that's what my kitchen has kind of become for them. Wonderful. What type of businesses use a commissary kitchen? So, wide variety of businesses that use it. People that meal prep, caterers, food trucks use it. Even some restaurants or some persons who may want to launch their restaurants. Uh, people use it as a ghost kitchen. Some chefs actually come there, cook their food use it uh, as a place where they can, you know, deliver their items out to the community. But it's a wide variety of persons who... You talked a little bit about not doing what you did at the beginning. Tell us about what you did and how a commissary kitchen kind of saves an entrepreneur of that. The way that we kind of wound up at a space where we were, my kitchen, is that we own a barbecue restaurant here in the city locally that just experienced a lot of ups and downs. I didn't necessarily know everything about the restaurant business, so I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I had some people that were surrounding me, and thank God for them, that were giving me advice and, you know, pointing me in different directions, but I didn't know menu development. I didn't know food costs. Um, I didn't know how to balance my book. I did not know, you know, how to do payroll and how to balance it and how many people I should have and all those different variables that play a part in, you know, making a brick and mortar actually work was some of the, just the biggest hurdles. And so um, because I didn't know and I didn't have the persons around me to mentor me in those areas, that's why we just kind of chose to start the My Kitchen concept, to keep those persons from having to try to figure those things out on their own. Uh, we, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I don't regret it at all because it was a great start for, you know, where we are now. You mentioned something about ghost kitchens as well and the way that food and beverage entrepreneurs may use a commissary kitchen. How does the ghost kitchen model work? If there is a person with a brand and they want to launch their brand without actually having a storefront or brick and mortar, they can basically come to our commissary as a safe place, cook their food, prepare their food in a safe environment that is, you know, of course, permitted by the local health department. And they can partner with your Grub South and your Uber Eats or any other local you know, delivery services that are out there. They can utilize those platforms to sell their product versus actually having people physically come to a location. They can just basically be a ghost kitchen without an address that, you know, is cooking in a safe place and still able to get their food in, in the, the people's mouth in the community. Tell me about a success story in my kitchen. Like who's who's used it, how they've used it, and what has been the sort of value of using a commissary kitchen? I would say there are a lot of people at the my kitchen table that I feel that are successful. Um, I've seen some persons who don't know anything about the business start a business. You know, uh, I've seen some come in, they don't have an LLC or EIN number. They know nothing about that. They know nothing about a sales tax account. They know nothing about those things. So, you know, and then I've also seen it on the other side where you have persons that have EINs and LLCs and they know how to at least pay their sales taxes, but they need help with menu development or how to, you know, close in and make their profit margins better. Uh, but one person in particular that really sticks out to me is Vuji Vegan. Uh, Vuji Vegan is by part one of the, she's a boss, you know, she's a boss, she handles business. Uh, but, you know, her backstory of how she had cancer, fought cancer, won the battle with cancer, started, you know, eating healthier, started Vuji Vegan. 
was once renting a food truck from a local guy who taught basically all of us in a sense how to you know uh, operate a food truck but you know it turned into she had a corporate job she needed more consistency and my kitchen was there to kind of help her make that happen so for Vuji Vegan I would have to say that she's at the top of our list as you know persons that are successful because since she's been with us for about two years now uh, we've helped her stabilize her brand and offer you know a consistent product to the community but in return now she has her own food truck and she's looking at her own piece of real estate you know and in the future her goal is franchising and uh, just per a conversation that we had you know just last week she was like I have to thank you because you know Bougie Vegan wouldn't be where it is now if it hadn't been for my kitchen so you know but there's a lot of other stories like that out there but you know, she just kind of hits the top of my list because she took on one of our most expensive packages by trusting us basically to run her day to day operation. So, yeah, that's amazing. I will also thank you for Vuji Vegan success <laughs> because I'm a big Vuji You're Vegan big fan. fan. <laughs> yes, I'm a big fan. I love the concept, love the food um, and have just been following like the progression of that. And it's super impressive. Like it's yeah. what you love to see if you follow food and beverage entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about the founding of your first venture. So what did you first launch and how was that launch? Actually, the first launch was not a restaurant business. Uh, the first launch was a church. You know, I pastor for seven years, preaching since I was 16, and uh, the first venture was a church. You know, that's what we launched here locally. The second venture was a daycare, and, you know, we had 90-plus kids with a staff, and everything was nonprofit. Everything was, you know, religious and in that Christian realm, and, um, you know, eventually at some point, I just kind of got to a place where I just felt like I needed to find me a little bit more and uh, wanted to press pause, you know. I don't run away from the church because I believe in the church, love the church, and know at some point we'll have to go back to some of those, you know, positions that we held at some point. But I just needed a, a moment to pause, you know. Um, at 16, having to bury people, marry people, funeralize people, um, you know, run finances and back offices and run a nonprofit and things like that and deal with children and their parents and you don't even have kids yourself at that point. Uh, all that stuff was a challenge for me. Um, but, you know, I just woke up one morning, felt like I had a release from God and he says, okay, I'm going to let you find yourself. And, uh, me finding myself actually started by me selling chicken plates out of that church kitchen. You know, me and my dad had a conversation. He gave me his recipes and he says, I'm going to say it to you once. And if you don't catch it, then you're just not going to have it. But I wrote it down and we eventually just tweaked it as we went. And uh, some of the people from the church, like we didn't have smokers, we didn't have grills. They brought their stuff, they let me use it. And then it just turned into a whole business. And then that's how we got to Big John's Harvest. Um, luckily, we had a local business in the city of Huntsville uh, who trusted his store manager, and she gave us a chance. Like, she ate our food at the church kitchen and was just like, hey, I know you don't know anything about restaurant business, but you can't keep doing this. Your food is too good for it to be where it is. And that's how we got our first opportunity to start our brick and mortar. Luckily, it was... Uh, already equipped kitchen you know in a rural area so that was a little scary because we were like I don't know how many people are going to actually drive to harvest but they showed up and it just uh, it was great it was great and the locals have been just you know following us along this journey like it, it's been a little rocky but you know they've been hanging in there with us it sounds like you had some mentorship, some opportunities, someone coming in and, and tasting your food and saying, hey, you, you should oh, yeah. move on to bigger things. Um, how important do you view mentorship, both the mentorship that you receive and the mentorship that you provide others? You know, relationships and networking and mentorship is crazy important. Like we all need it. We have to have it. If we don't have it, I don't think we'll be as successful as we need to be. Like. We all have to, at some point, uh, find someone that's in a place where we're not and really hang on to them tight to say, hey, teach me how to get to this place. Um, you know, a lot of people, some people feel comfortable being at a table where, you know, they are the table. But I feel like if we're going to be at any 
way successful we're going to have to learn how to sit at different tables with different people that can teach us different ways you know because we really I don't want to be at a table and I'm the only person that knows how to do it you know I want to be at a table where somebody can teach me how to make what I'm doing better you know uh, so mentorship is important and you're right we did start like we invited local people that I had you know met and cross pathways with as a pastor or people who business owners local business owners you know local people we brought them in similar to what you're doing to me uh, set them at a table white plated their food set them in front of a camera took pictures with them asked their feedback you know and uh, we just kind of got from there the more people of influence ate the food the more people start saying, well, if they're eating the food, I want to eat the food. And so it just kind of became our marketing. But at the same time, those persons, you know, still to this day, they eat the food. And it all started from us saying, hey, come, come eat, try this thing out. So mentorship is important. Now, on the, on the other side with us, uh, mentorship is important, too. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Mm -hmm. It gets a little overwhelming at times because now... Uh, we're kind of buzzing a little bit and people are like, man, you need to go to my kitchen. My kitchen is the place you need to be attached to. And while I'm grateful for it and I'm not complaining about it at all, I'm still trying to learn how to balance because I'm a type of person, I'll pour out everything I got, you know, and I'll just talk, talk, talk and we'll sit down and next, you know, 30 minutes turns into an hour, hour turns into two hours and by the time you're done, you're drained. You know, I'm still trying to learn how to create those spaces um, for those persons that are really needing the mentorship, but um, it's, it's really kind of taxing on the time sometimes. One thing that stood out to me in our conversation before was really around the fact that you took your food business and you turned it into multiple sort of streams of revenue, like multiple opportunities, multiple angles around the food, whether it's food trucks, the barbecue, the corporate catering. Tell me all of the different sort of food businesses that you're currently operating under your umbrella. We have the Fry Box, which is an event truck and a lunch truck. So, you know, it's, it's moving. You know, we were just at Jazz in the Park last yesterday. It will be at Jazz in the Park again. You know, we're at local companies and we're at special events. So that truck moves around a lot. And then we have Big John's Barbecue. Uh, Big John's Barbecue is at the open bottle on 72. It's just a truck that sits, you know, stationary there on the patio there. And we do bar hours there with them on the weekends. Uh, that's when they have their live music and things of that nature. So we're there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 4 to 9. Uh, we do have Big John's Catering. That kind of was just birthed out of you know the brick and mortar that we originally had and it's kind of just grew over into being what it is now so we cater a lot of corporate events and you know just from small to big like you know last week we did 972 people this past weekend it was you know 30 people so you know it kind of just depends that catering thing it just kind of goes from small to big um, and then we have a corporate account. The corporate account is at PPG Aerospace. It's our first corporate account, which we were crazy excited about. Uh, that actually came by, by way of one of our customers who ate at the 53 location when we were in Harvest. They ate there at the location with us and basically came back and said, hey, you know, there's an opportunity that I think you need to take advantage of. And uh, we didn't know what we was getting ourselves into, but again, it went back to mentorship. Uh, one of my great mentors is uh, Michelle De Johnson. She um, she ran for a councilman seat here locally, but she also owned Edible Arrangements before it sold to Oakwood. And so she's one of the ones that I just kind of throw ideas at, and I'm just like, hey, what do you think about this? And uh, after we actually got to talking, I found out that she used to be an HR person at PPG. And so she was able to kind of give us a little bit more insight. But we bid on the job. We went in there. We cooked. We gave it our best. And uh, we were awarded the opportunity to be there. And so we're about a year in now. And, uh, yeah, it's going. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, I want to talk a little bit about streamlining operations. How do you manage to efficiently operate and manage all of these different aspects of a food business without compromising on quality? <laughs> 
Um, quality presentation, customer service, consistency are, are my tops. And uh, I preach it until I'm blue in the face. Like my team knows it. They know my expectation. They know don't send. Uh, the crazy thing about Big John's is this. Nine times out of ten, because we take good pictures, people come to our restaurant and they get off into the market and they see the food and it's like, oh man, it looks good. Oh, that's beautiful. And so the goal for me is we've never taken pictures of food that we couldn't recreate in the kitchen on a daily. And so it's very important that what they see on a picture is what they get when they come to our restaurant. And so I'm real big on that. There have been some pictures that have floated around that didn't meet the eye. And I'm in a group message and I'm screaming like, hey, listen, <laughs> this ain't it. You know, uh, this don't look good. Like, you know, luckily the customer didn't complain about it because the food was just great. You know, and they, you know, humbly say that. But at the same time, uh, presentation people eat with their eyes before they eat with their mouths and um, you know so I want that experience to be what it is and you know consistency consistency is big because a lot of people don't follow recipes you know it's a little dab here a little dab here you go to a restaurant and one day it tastes like this and the next day it tastes like this and you're just like man I want what I had last week but I can't get it because you didn't have a recipe that your team follows so you know we have recipe books and they know don't deviate away from it uh, one of the great posts that I mean we just got this last uh, maybe a couple days ago a person screenshotted it and uh, on the comment he said from 53 to the patio meaning where we were now he was like you know I ate this food and this food has the same taste and that was three years ago you know so that that's my expectation like quality presentation consistency and customer service like those are at the top of our list my team knows it and i don't just say it once i keep saying it i put it in front of their face we post it on the walls we put it on shirts like you know they know what the expectation is so it's important and I wish more other restaurants and food service professionals would, you know, really grab a hold to that because I think some people would be more successful if they were just consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's that's the key, being consistent. So that is music to my ears. I, in working with clients, whether it's around food businesses or any type of business, especially in the social media age, the biggest pillar of marketing I tell people is consistency. It's not all of the various things that you think make up marketing. It's establishing what your brand or what your visual or what the experience is and then being able to replicate that experience over and over again. Yeah. And the unique position we're in with social media now is people are going to share photos of your food. So it's yeah. not as simple as what I put up on the menu yeah. was to entice you and get you through the door. And then what I deliver on your table Absolutely. isn't consistent. Yeah. That's going to, you know, lose you points all the time. And there's nothing worse than there's a food that I like or a place that I go and I enjoy it. Yeah. And then I have friends in town and I'm like, we got to go this place because they have amazing fried fish yeah. and we go and it's not the same it's experience. It kills it. Yeah. It kills it. And as a, customer and someone who tends to be very critical of marketing, I will totally say that the biggest pillar is the consistency and the experience you're providing, not all of the bells and whistles and colors that you think make up your marketing, but like, what are you <clears throat> delivering by customer experience? So I am thrilled to hear that that's like your mantra and your philosophy with your team and it explains your success. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like that's why people keep coming. Like you said, keep coming back. That's why they keep telling people about it. You know, if uh, if it's a raw case of chicken, we season it with the same amount of seasoning, you know what I'm saying, every time. We use measuring cups. We follow recipes. Like, those things are just important. And a lot of people don't like to, you know, get off into all the different kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, it's the thing that, you know, it sets you up for longevity, you know. And regardless if, uh, like, the Fry Box is a new concept, but it's a spinoff of a Big John's brand. And, uh, you know, the sauces and then, you know, um, set yourself up with something that that sets you apart. You know, don't just pour something out of a bottle, you know, um, <laughs> make your own recipes like, you know, take some stuff, test some stuff out. Like we try, let's just say ranch, for instance, ranch is a big thing for us. Um, 
listen, I probably kept them in the kitchen to two o'clock one morning. I remember uh, trying out ranch recipes and it wasn't until we got the herbs and the spices down to where I wanted them at before I was just like, okay. And once we got it, it was written down. We knew what it was. And then that's still the recipe that follows it. You know what I'm saying? And even now, uh, there's only one person in our kitchen with four different things, five different things going on that fixes our our sauces. Not mm -hmm. to say that the team doesn't know how to do it, but there's one retired food service guy who's been working with us for five years. Like specifically, that's his job. He comes in, he makes sauces. Like he's over prepping and making sure that that stuff. So, delegation, delegation is important too. You know, being okay with delegating persons to do certain things is important. So. That's another biggie. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't do this by myself. If it wasn't because of my team helping me, I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, my mom came off of a job that she's been on for 20 years to work for us. That's big. You know, we've retired her and set her at home, but she don't want to go home. She still shows up to work every day. You know, uh, but if it wasn't because of my mom or my wife or the other persons who've been there for, you know, five years with us, um, we wouldn't be where we are today. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. Jonathan couldn't do it by myself because it's just too much going on. So having strong key people on your team that understand what you're doing, believe in what you're doing, is important too. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And that's nice fun fact. Yeah. yeah. Get you a sauce guy. Like <laughs> yeah, get, you a sauce. get you a sauce guy. Get you a sauce guy. You gotta that's have a sauce nice. guy. That's nice. A fun fact of making ranch from scratch. Like yeah. that's that's amazing. Um, whose job was it to tell mom she had to go home? Um, I felt like it was my job. Okay, how'd that go? Yeah, I think it was my job. She she said she didn't want to go home okay. yet. And that was that. <laughs> you know, but I I think you know, as a as a kid, I saw my mom work three or four jobs. You know, I understood the grind even more once I started grinding, and uh, I understood the hustle and I, I understood the sacrifices that she made. And uh, when she took the step, like she's always been my ride or die. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how mother-son relationships are with anybody else, but I just know me and my mother's relationship, like if it's nobody else that's going to ride with Jonathan, it's going to be, hey, let's get in this car and let's go. It, whether it's a food truck or a catering job or in the kitchen or we're prepping or we're staying at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, like she's going to be that person to do it. But <clears throat> that same work ethic that she had working for other people, it's the same work ethic that she brought to the table with us. You know, and there were times where, you know, I was just like, Mama can't pay you. And she's just like, well, pay me when you can. Or, you know, don't worry about it this week. But it didn't stop her from showing up the next week and doing what she needed to do. So. You know, once we got to a place in, in a space where I felt like, okay, you know, we can actually do this and you not have to be here every day and, you know, can give you an opportunity at 65 to say, hey, I'm going to go home and, you know, rest. Uh, I feel good about it, you know, but uh, again, she was just like, no, it's too early for me to go home. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's I amazing. understand it. You know, they like to keep going and things of that nature. So. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. my mom right now. There's she's not going to stop but she enjoys it and yep. she is absolutely my biggest support system she's my advisor like i could not do could not do this without you mom <laughs> let's talk a little bit about marketing strategies what marketing strategies and tactics have you found to be the most effective across all of your businesses what works best for you uh you know uh honestly this is my weak spot you know uh marketing is Ooh, it's a it's an ever turning thing, you know. It's always a new trend. There's always a new something going on. There's always uh, and I just always felt like one. If I'm always chasing the new trend, I'm I'm just gonna always be in this whirlwind of trying to you know stay ahead of the curve. And uh, I've learned that you know sometimes it's not in the best interest of the business to always try to stay ahead of the curve. It's just master the curve that you're Absolutely. in and you know figure out how to turn that thing without flipping the car over and so that's that's kind of been my approach is stay in my lane one things that you know we tried steel graphics steel graphics didn't get the response that we needed so pictures got us the response people like to again go back to that 
they eat with their eyes before they eat with their mouths. So they wanted to see the food. Mm -hmm. They wanted to experience that food when they got it. So for us, there's been a lot of food pictures and things of that nature. Recently, uh, we hired a wonderful lady. Uh, her name is Britt Silcox. And um, she's over uh, Bright Eyed Marketing. And uh, she's local, and she's really good about coming in, grabbing content, staying in the kitchen, taking pictures, doing reels, all those types of things. Those are my weak areas, mm -hmm. you know. So having a good person is it cheap? No, <laughs> but it's necessary. Um, there's some other stuff out there that I know we probably need. We need to be taken advantage of when it comes down to the marketing, but I just can't speak a lot on that one. That is an excellent point in an excellent observation one hiring the talent that you need which you already mentioned delegation so um a lot of people want to take certain aspects on and that's not their area of expertise getting the right people with the right vision that can come in and translate that for your business is huge um photos photos and food businesses how do you what do you find works the best with the photos that you take like what is there a thing? Is there like a angle or an approach or a yeah. distance even? What uh, do you find to have the best effect? Yeah, but yeah, angles, pictures. Uh, again, that's another one of my weaknesses. So I just say, hey, come in, grab what you need. Tell me what I need to do. And nine times out of ten, they send me a list and say, we need this, this, this. Uh, we need you to go ahead and prepare yourself to fix it. Uh, take it out of a styrofoam box, put it on a white plate, put it on a wood plank, you know, start being a little bit more creative with it. Um, other than just saying, hey, here it is, you know, uh, take your time with it, you know. Wonderful. That's excellent. <clears throat> um, let's talk a little bit about menus. You mentioned in our conversation before that that's an area that you want to, to you know, message on that's an area where you want to educate people because you see that there's a, a pitfall there tell me about the challenges of a menu crafting a menu managing a menu mm. uh, that menu development is everything you know um, honestly when we started 53 and I have to go back there because that's where I learned a lot of my lessons from you know we didn't know anything about menu development at that point we just knew you know, we ate at this barbecue restaurant and we wanted it to be what it is. You know, we want our menu to look like theirs or we ate at this situation. And so you kind of just take your experiences and you put them together on this piece of paper and you call it a menu. And then uh, you get these people that come to your counter and they're just like, it's a great idea, but I want this. And so your customers over time will tell you what they want. You know, they'll tell you what they want to experience. They'll tell you what they want to eat. They'll tell you what they're going to buy, you know, because if they come in there, you're not selling it and you're not, you're not making any money off of it. And there's no sense in continuing to buy. So I think one thing is listen to your customers, man, listen to your customers. If your customers say they don't want something, they don't want it. It's not going to sell. They're not going to eat it. They're not going to purchase it. They're not going to tell anybody else about it. So listen to your customers. Um, be flexible. A lot of people are not flexible when it comes down to their menu development. This is just what I want. This is the way I want it. And I don't care who says they want it or don't want it. I want it. You know, but is what you want is that selling. You know, and nine times out of ten is not selling. And you probably need to change it. You know, I can't tell you how many times we've changed a menu. And at first, you know, we had everything. It was family packs and ribs here and wings this and, you know, fresh mac and cheese and cabbage and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm not telling you that that stuff wasn't good because it was great, but we were wasting too. Our food waste, our cost was just out the roof. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars just in food costs. Like every year, if you had a five, six hundred thousand dollar a year, you know, and more or right at half of that is going in food costs. That's a lot of money, you know, but that was just the ignorant part of it. We didn't know. And so I didn't want, I, I don't want people that are getting into the food service business to make a lot of, of those same mistakes. So I guess the biggest thing for me to kind of sum that up is simplicity is the key. Like 
you can have 10 great items that people love and you don't have to change it. Just make that your base menu. I think people need to learn how to build a base menu and then just do some specials every now and then, you know? Um, that's how we kind of keep ahead of the trend. Like we have a base menu, this is what we're going to get. You know you can come there and get it every time. It's going to taste the same, it's going to look the same, it's going to be what it is. If it can't be that, then we're not going to serve it. But for the most part, you know, this is our menu and this is what it's going to be. And then if it is something that's out there that's trending that we know that we can do, you know, we may bring it on on a Saturday or a Friday and just say, hey, this is what we're doing. But to make sure that our food cost stays where our food cost needs to stay, you know, um, that menu development and simplicity is the key. You know, we have five different things going on, like we feed... I'm going to say humbly, third, uh, you know, thousands of people on a weekly basis. And, uh, you know, we're staying at 28% food costs. That's really great, you know. And, uh, but, you know, six months ago, we were at 36%. You know, <laughs> probably a year ago, we was at 40 some percent. But the more we simplified the menu, the more we kind of paid attention to the food costs, you know. And then pay attention to that. Pay attention to your vendors that you're using. You know, shop for the right price. You know, even with us being a small business, you know, there are vendors out there that are okay with going back to other vendors and saying, hey, can we get a better price for this person? And I've learned that if you build a relationship and make some commitments with certain vendors, you know, you can get some, some better pricing. So that's kind of my, my approach, simplicity. That's you know, amazing. And listen to your customers. Yeah, that's amazing. If they amazing. don't want it, don't cook it. Yeah. yeah and I, I like I'm an analytics person and I don't know how how big I imagine with your business it's been important to look at where something was and how it's moved to something else and things like I want a novelty item on my menu like something that people read and they say this is really unique and I want to try that mm -hmm. and the first time sales with that does not tell the same story as the long-term repeated sales with that and that's where tracking and analytics are important to know how did this sell out the gate yeah. versus how is this selling a month later? Yeah. Was it novelty and something I was, you know, people were interested in because it was the first time or yeah. are they consistently selling it? And there is there are businesses like that that launch on niche. Right. So yeah. things like um, I won't call a particular business, but like I make nothing but unique versions of peach cobbler mm. and that's all I make. Yeah. And is that when you open, everyone's interested in getting it because it's unique? Or like, are we really selling consistently peach cobbler nine months, a year, or two years later? And that's where I get concerned with menus. Yeah, because uh, a menu is not just peach cobbler, <laughs> you know, uh, and you got to have more than just one item. But then you don't need, you know, I'm not going to say a certain restaurant name, uh, but you don't need 200 items on your menu either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? uh, can you master 10 good options versus me trying 10 options on this 100 page menu uh, and me not throw away all 10 items out of 100 and have to come back, you know, 100 more times to figure out which thing that I actually like because you haven't learned how to master one thing? Uh, that that's a frustration too. Some people have these big, long menus, drawn out concepts, and I'm just like, mm -mm. yeah, you're you know, absolutely right. That's you don't facts. need, don't do that. <laughs> you don't need to. Do, I tasted that. That wasn't good. Like the texture was wrong. The taste was wrong. You know, and 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 be okay with constructive criticism. A lot of people are like, oh, I cooked all these years. You know, my family cooked it this way. You know, well. Maybe your family liked it, but you know I don't like it. Yeah. But they don't like it. It's not selling. You know, yeah. ten people at this table don't like it. You know the way that your family used to cook it. So maybe you either go back and tweak it and present it to us again and see if we'll like it better this way. But people are not okay sometimes in this food industry with constructive criticism. Everybody has the best everything. Mm -hmm. No, I, you know, I'll tell people, and people, so this is one thing too, people would come to us and they'd be like, man, and then, oh, uh, I think you need to change this, so I think you need to change that. Now, some items, you know, once you create it and it's been selling, 
and people are buying it, you'll still get that one person that'll come and say, man, I think you need to do something different with that. I'm thinking like it's 200 people that's buying it and loving it. You know, at that point, you listen to that customer mm -hmm. still, but I also tell that person and challenge that person, stop getting the barbecue sauce if you don't like it. There are five different other sauces on here. I'm pretty sure that you're going to like one of them because we make all of them. All of them are unique. And if you don't like one thing, try a different thing. Um, but yeah, you know, being okay with being who you are, offer a variety of items, you know, so that anybody can eat there. I think that's important. That menu development, I can go on and on about it because the more I'm sitting here thinking about it, I'm thinking like you need a variety of the menu. You need to keep it simple, but your kids need to be able to eat there. Your grandmama need to be able to eat mm -hmm. there. Everybody in between need to be able to eat there. And so, you know, and I can speak for our menu. We got something that a kid can eat, a college student will look at it and be like, man, I got to have it. But then we got the grandmama that say, give me that two piece fried dinner. You know, woman came, got off from work, beautician, came to the truck window. She was like, listen, I had to come over here and get my fish because I needed my fix. And then, you know, you give her a piece of filet that's too small. And she was like, y'all ain't got no bigger filet in here. I'm like, yes, ma'am, we do. You know, we fry an extra piece of fish, but it's... It's that type of thing. When I see the young and the old and everybody in between that comes and eats with us, um, that makes me happy because I know that we have a menu that ain't just, you know, burgers and fries. It ain't just, you know, fatty foods or whatever the case may be. It's something that, you know, everybody can partake, partake in. Yeah, that's an uh, excellent point. And I think there's a nugget in there as well around there's cooking and there's running a business mm -hmm. and cooking may feel very personal cooking maybe this is my mom's recipe this is my grandma's recipe we cook it every year at thanksgiving yeah. like that personal connection you have with food and that's where a lot of small businesses start from yeah. but then there's an aspect which is running a business mm -hmm. and running the business is then looking at your analytics looking at your sales looking at your food costs and being willing to make adjustments in order to run a good business and those two things are not always in lockstep but it sounds like you found a really good balance in being able to do so yeah, yeah. and flexibility is the key with that you know i'm not afraid to be flexible I'm not afraid to take something off I'm not afraid to add something on excellent so we are just at time i have one more question I want I feel like we've covered everything but there's just one more question I do want to cram in just around um well two really one is advice for aspiring entrepreneurs so you've covered a bunch of things that are phenomenal pieces of advice and nuggets for creative food and beverage entrepreneurs what's something that just stands out as like the the one or the two things that if you're getting into this business or if you're you're moving forward in this business what would you what wisdom would you like to impart um be teachable that's at the top of my list always stay in a place to where you can be taught um, no matter how successful you become in this industry um, always stay in a place where you you know can gain wisdom you know always understand you're not going to know everything about it but always, uh, you know, find find you a good mentor. That would be my second advice. Number one, teachable. Two, find you a good mentor. And I'm not talking about a mentor that's on the same level that you are. Find you a mentor that's out there making four or five times more than what you're making. And they can teach you and slap you across the head when you're, you know, your decisions ain't the best decisions. <clears throat> you know, one of the greatest persons, and I have to give him a shout out, and I call him Coach Young, but he's Eugene. He owns Champies here in the city. He also owns Champies at the Trash Panda Stadium. And there's not an idea that I don't have or a business move that I make without throwing it at him. You know, he works at IBM. You know, he owns these two restaurants. They're successful. He's making great, you know, financial decisions and. You know, those are the type of people that you want to kind of, you know, he can't be everybody's coach, but, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, if it's something that I want to text, if it's late at night or if it's something spontaneous, like the thing about it is find you a person that understands business too, because they don't mind you texting in the middle of the night sometimes, you know, because sometimes this stuff hits us at two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, and I want somebody that can say, well, hey, before it slips my mind, I just want to throw it at you. Totally. That's amazing. Um. And even with your amount of success, which those getting started may look at and say, you know, you've, you've 
won the game, you even have a mentor that you oh, consult yeah. and teaching moments and lessons that are coming down to you that are continuing to develop you. Absolutely. You got to have accountability. I think the church taught me that, you know, you always got to stay in a place of accountability. You know, no senior pastor doesn't have a board of somebody behind him that's not holding him accountable. And hopefully he has somebody outside of the church that's pastoring a church larger than he is, or even if it's not as larger than he is, at least they've been in the game longer than he has been that can teach him how to be a better pastor or preacher. You know, the church taught me that, you know, and I understood the importance of having accountability in place. You know, even though I'm not in the pulpit preaching pastor in a congregation right now, those same pastors that covered me are still covering my businesses. Mm -hmm. Like they're at every ribbon cutting, you know, they're standing right beside me. They're praying with me. They're texting me when they're trying out, you know, rib recipes in their own backyard. Like, hey, Bishop is uh, barbecuing today. And I'm like, okay, it looked good. Do it taste as good as it look, you know? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, even those same accountability partners that, you know, covered me then are still covering the business. And so finding mentorships and uh, accountability partners, you know, that you can bounce it out. That's it. That's just important. Mm -hmm. You know, you need true people, not a lot of yes people. I mean, it's good to get a yes from a group of people and you just be like, man, I knew I was on it. But it's even better to get a no from a person and know that I missed the mark or I need to go back to the drawing table, you know. So for me, yeah, be teachable and find you a good mentor. What's next for uh, my kitchen, Big John's Barbecue? Like what any plans that are enough out of the hopper that you can share? Like what's what's next for these businesses? Yeah, um, my kitchen finally has a home and I'm excited about that. So we'll be moving to the new Westline development. Um, you know, that's exciting because we were able to give our brand legs in a borrowed space and it kind of turned into what it is now. We didn't know how well it was going to go, but luckily we had some people that had some spaces that was just like, hey, I trust you enough. Here are the keys. Give it some legs. Let's see where it goes. And here it is. Two years later, we're still standing strong. And uh, so to be able to go into a place that we call our own home, you know, um, and have a lease agreement that, you know, gives us the, the length that we need to scale the business and offer, you know, our services to a more variety of people is, uh, is exciting. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm excited about <clears throat> the possibility of uh, turning my kitchen into a, a, a university at some point. You know, uh, Huntsville doesn't really have a culinary degree program. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of speaking up way ahead of it because I don't necessarily know all that it's going to take to make that happen if we are going to wind up partnering with a local school or trying to get something from the ground. But uh, one of our biggest goals with us moving to Westlawn is to bring some kind of accredited culinary degree program back to Huntsville uh, and wanting my kitchen to kind of be the, the leading way in that. You know, I'm not saying that I have to be the leading way, but I would love for my kitchen to be the you know the train that kind of runs it as far as the restaurants you know uh with with time and 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 with evaluations uh that's why we've started some of the other brands uh because we want to franchise but we also know that in order to franchise these businesses have to be more self-sufficient type of businesses mm -hmm. and uh i as much as i would love to franchise the big john's barbecue brand um, it's just it's not self-sufficient like somebody has to run a smoker somebody has to know the skill uh, and I don't want to be the barbecue restaurant that's cooking at one location putting this stuff in a bag shipping it out to 10 different places and then the, we lose on the quality side of it um, so then we start just tampering off into uh, Big John's Philly or the Fry Box and things like that and the ultimate goal is to to franchise to when the time is right you know, um, and then empower some of the people that are around us that have been at the table with us for a while. Uh, we made the decision to, to gift them portions of the business so that they can, uh, you know, buy houses and cars. And, you know, I don't want to be the only person at the table winning either. You know, it's either 
uh, we win or I'm just another loser type of mindset for me. You know, I want all of us to win. I want all of us to go far. Uh, and I don't want to be uh, the only person at the table that's going somewhere. So those are kind of the mixture of things that, you know, the future would hold for us. That's amazing. Well, congratulations on the anticipated move to West Lawn and future business expansion. Um, yeah, we can go down the rabbit hole of equity. That's a whole nother conversation. And we will in the future have more interviews <laughs> to talk about that. But that is a fascinating approach and I've seen a lot of very successful businesses take that approach and I think it giving back to your contributors is huge in the long-term success of your business um, but I want to thank you again um, this has been phenomenal like just so much great information of course I always enjoy our conversations um, and we will have more in the future but thank you again Jonathan for uh, stopping by and just talking through a lot of this with us I'm sure it's going to be um, really appreciated by the community yeah. Thank you for having me. Awesome.